Welcome to Markets Now. I'm Michelle Rook along with Scott Barlick with Coima Coima Barlick. We've got some mixed trade in grain and livestock futures going on over in the grains. You've got the feed grain sector, both corn and wheat futures, a little higher soybeans setting back. And then uh, hogs are to the plus side, but cattle may be seeing a little pressure here. And Scott, some of that after these record high prices and both the futures and cash profit taking, what, a little bit of hedge selling or what's going on? Yeah, we've got a lot to unravel here. It yeah. uh, finally had its blow up. And thanks for having me, by the way. Finally had our, our, our blow up rally, all time highs. Cash took off. Cash rallied $20 in three weeks, which is just uh, something that's never been done before, unless I uh, can't find one that I missed. But I, I'm pretty sure $20 in three weeks is a, is a quick jump. So we have been harping on it for years, talking about the tight supply and the leverage that the producers are going to have. And and yesterday was the day that that news finally paid off and what you knew finally happened. And it did feel like a lot of leverage into the uh, producers' hands and they were able to ask more. We, we topped out the market. The highest I heard was some 185. Um, it, there was some 184s. You, you had some lower 180s up to 290 in the meat. And the South was able to get some 176, pass some 176, a little bit undecided there. But the North has, has certainly pushed that cash higher. And yesterday, you know, it's a it's a time of year when you can have some of those highs and you, you've got that spring grilling season buying. And, and maybe that's when you can put in a high. Once that's happened, hey, market tops when the news is the best. So there's there's plenty of people maybe thinking that and and. Chart wise, we have to talk about some charts in the cattle, in my opinion here, because you've got all of these extra longs carrying on and you had your third gap higher on some of those charts. Sometimes when they gap higher three times, uh, that can be called an exhaustion gap. And you look at some long term charts, a, a number that guys have been saying for quite some time is this 175. And you can measure that from the COVID lows down there at 81 up till they gapped. Uh, in about the mid 120s and measure on top of that, it measures right to 175. So there's plenty of technical signs kind of saying, hey, maybe this thing is, is about right there. So so what does that mean to the grand scheme of things? I, I think it's like when you're driving your pickup and that check engine light comes on. OK, it, it might be nothing. It might just be a sensor, but but it can mean that something's wrong. And maybe that's a little bit of a signal that, hey, maybe I have to maybe I have to do something here and reward this market. So not necessarily a blow off top because that's usually how the cattle market seems to top you like you say when the news gets the best i got to wonder though you know are folks making money at these levels finally we talk about these record high cash prices and that it's finally your time to get these but are you making money yeah it's uh it's been tough cost of gains have been uh well over projections when you were buying your feeder calves and you're hearing, you know, on closeouts, cost of gains that are all over the board versus inside cattle versus where they at. The corn basis stayed so strong in cattle feeding country. So uh, it's been tough. I think the 165 guys, I really wasn't hearing any meat on the bone. Uh, there was negative closeouts coming in at the 165 levels. I'm kind of thinking these last two weeks, uh, this rally from 177 to 185 for the northern guys might actually, you know, it should put some green ink on and unless, you know, there's a few of those horror stories of cost of gains that really got out of line. But there's not a lot of meat on the bone here. And if you're saying, OK, we've been slowly losing money all the way through these tight numbers on this rally. And finally, we're there. You don't want to see it give up right now because we're finally maybe going to see just in the last couple of weeks that there's a little green ink yet to be seen when these checks roll in and, and the closeouts happen, whether whether they actually made money because there's been some 130 cost of gains. There's been some uh, upper one dollars cost of gains, dollar 90s. It's, it's kind of all over the board. So um, some of those high cost of gains are really hurting. Not seeing a lot of meat yet until just the last two weeks. Okay. And like we say, maybe this is a healthy correction. Packers are still pretty short and the futures are already discount to the cash here. So let's talk about next week. Do you think cash trade will continue to be higher? Will the Packers still have to chase this thing? Chase it real hard, like we said, the last three weeks. And now you get your first little correction in the market. And, and you already noted it yesterday's trade. You had some of those mid 180s trades and as soon as the market broke some of those packers did pull some bids back right. suddenly you couldn't quite get what you were getting earlier in the day when the party was happening or the night before so i i think the packer will probably try to use this to advantage to try to 
pull that back. And now there's uh, plenty of people on the other end of the phone starting to wonder if maybe I need to be out of some of these long term. Maybe I've got to look at doing some hedges. So, and the Packers are going to slow down their kill this time of year. The calf crop's not quite ready yet. So uh, they're going to be pretty light. And, and we're all turning into our pens and looking, saying, okay, what, what's close to ready here? I want to try to capitalize on some of this high cash. So, so it wouldn't surprise me if they just tried to pull back, uh, okay. slow down the kill, um, offer some prices a little lower, see what they can get just to try to get some of this calf crop ready. Because I, I, I think if they made another big dive up to 190, 195, I'd, you're not going to find any more numbers. We're going to continue to fall back on that throughout the year. We know the numbers are tight. We're going to be tight all year. It's going to be even tighter in the fourth quarter. So I was going to say, we're not even into the tightest numbers yet, Scott. That's right. It, it's just going to be something that we're going to continue to focus on throughout the year. Uh, it, it's going to stay tight. Uh, we should stay current. It, it feels good. So I don't know if corrections are going to be all that long, in my opinion. Um, we've rallied a long ways here. But, yeah, we're, we're feeling still good about it. Yeah. Brad calls it the bull market of his career. So, Obviously, we got to respect that. So the flip side of that, you had new contract highs in the front months of the cattle yesterday. We were making new contract lows over in the hogs, and some of that's been a function of these cattle hog spreads. Are we going to unwind some of those, or are we going to see some short covering finally here by these funds who are undoubtedly super short? Yeah, good question. It's uh, it's record wide between um, hogs and cattle, and everybody likes to say, hey, that shouldn't be that discount, right? Should pork really be that much cheaper? Or, or aren't they going to just buy this pork? And I think the beef demand, pork demand has separated themselves over the years as far as that's concerned, in my opinion. Um, so I think that there can be a pretty big difference between beef and pork, and it can stay that way. Now, it, it's a little bit of uh, two different markets. As tight as you are in beef, it's going to have to be high, the, the tight supply that we have. Um, but the funds have continued to push this pork market lower and lower and lower and, and retailers making large margins. So there is some pork that's at a higher level. It's just not making it into the producer's hands. So, I mean, there, there's there's a little bit of that to look at. But how these funds are going to trade, continue to press lower. They don't just try to say, hey, this looks like enough. This is a spot I want to get out for the funds. They're going to wait for a sign that this market has turned. They're going to have their signals. And then as it starts to turn around and come back, that's when they're going to say, okay, we're going to hit stops. Now we're going to get out of the markets. You're going to have to see, you know, I don't know what their signals are going to be, but they're going to have to find a little bit of a breakout to the upside or something that's saying this hog market's turning before they liquidate. One day rally is probably not going to be enough to scare them, say, hey, that's it. I'm out of the market. But, mm -hmm. but their targets um, to get out of the market are probably being pulled down pulling down with the markets. And then when they hit it, then we can say, okay, now it looks like things are breaking out. It's going to have to prove itself before uh, it's going to wiggle the shorts out of the market. Gotcha. So corn market, we saw some unwinding of the bull spreads yesterday. They're back on this morning, especially with that China business. So we, we had this morning, 15 million bushels, but I guess I'm wondering, you know, we're going to go into option expiration. Obviously you've got May contracts, which are going to go into delivery here pretty soon. Is that going to continue to stay that way? And what does this mean for cash basis levels, especially in areas where you're at a deficit? The basis has proven that it wants to stay strong in the, you know, that regional imbalance that we have in the corn, uh, you know, across the corn belt. So, it feels like the futures can't rally all the way up to some of this, this cash prices that that you're seeing and maybe some of the western part of the corn belt um so it has to almost stay somewhere in the middle because it, it's two different stories there on on how that unfolds but we're we're a long ways away from getting a new crop into the bin and, and end users are still going to need to buy some corn so you're still seeing those bull spreads work i think that stays on and we're gonna we're gonna have to continue to keep that premium on the the May and the July contracts. You know, thirty cent difference between the May and July. That's just such a, a wild trade that there has to be that much difference. But I think it's just more of that hand to mouth from end users. I'm just trying to stay in the game, trying to keep some corn coming. I feel like I want that discount that's coming later, so I don't want to overbuy right here because I think there's opportunity later. So that's why that may can now catch back up and stay, you know, stay strong relative to the rest of the market. And, and then we're just going to have to turn 
to look at our planning season as that's uh, going underway right now. Yeah, no doubt. And it'll be interesting to see how fast we get planted and how much pressure that actually puts on the new crop contracts. All right. Thanks for joining us. Scott Barlake with Quima Quima Barlake. And that is Markets Now.